Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Community Bookstores virtual event series. My name is Noah Mintz. I'm the store's event coordinator. Community Bookstore is celebrating over 50 years in business, and we credit the continued support of readers and writers for this milestone, and especially translators. So thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, I'm thrilled today to welcome Jeremy Tiang for the release of Shuang Zhui Tao's Rouge Street, which is out now in Jeremy's translation from Metropolitan Books and joined in conversation with Anton Herr. Now some housekeeping before I introduce our guests. We've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe setting. So if your version of Zoom is up to date, click on the live transcription button at the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. If you have any questions for tonight's guests, please click on the Q&A button, which is also at the bottom of your screen to submit them. We will be asking those at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. There's a chat box through which I will be posting a link to buy tonight's book if you haven't already. And one caveat for tonight's event is that we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections. So please bear with any technical issues that could arise. We'll try to resolve them quickly. We have a great lineup of events planned for you at Community Bookstore as we head into spring. So head over to our website, communitybookstore.net and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One that I want to point out in particular is next Tuesday, May 3rd. We're thrilled to welcome Fernando A. Flores for his new book, Valley-esque, in conversation with the actor Raul Castillo. That program is up on our website now and taking registrations. So now a little about tonight's guests and we'll get started. Jeremy Tiang uh, has translated over 20 books from Chinese. His novel State of Emergency won the Singapore Literature Prize in 2018. He also writes and translates plays. He is currently the Princeton University translator in residence and on the judging panel of the International Booker Prize. And Anton Herr was nominated for the 2022 International Booker Prize for his translations of Bora Chung's Cursed Bunny and Song Young Park's Love in the Big City. He'll be teaching at the Breadloaf Translators Conference in the US and the British Center for Literary Translation Summer School in the UK this year. So now without any further ado, I'll hand it off to you. Jeremy, Anton, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Noah. Hello, Brooklyn and the greater Brooklyn area. Uh, I am Anton. I'm here with Jeremy Tiang, with Jeremiah, Jessica Parker, Ruth Bader Ginsburg Tiang. Um, we are going to talk about, of course, Rouge Street by Shuang Xue Tao, uh, available now at Community Bookstore in Brooklyn. Yes, thank you very much. And um, why don't we jump right into it? So, Jeremy, here's my first question for you. This is a great book, by the way, a book that is at once stylistically pleasing and an entertaining read at the same time. You really do get three different books for the price of one. I always love a bargain. Uh, I enjoy the first novella. I was astonished by the second and riveted to the end by the third. I could see why any translator would want to take on this book. If I could read Chinese, I would do that myself. But I have to ask this question. What made you choose this book to translate? Uh, thanks, Anton. Uh, and thanks, Community Bookstore, for having us. Um, well, the first thing to say is that there was no this book to start with. Um, you say it's three books in one, but in Chinese, it actually was three separate books, um, or rather three separate collections. Um, but the novella plus a bunch of short stories model of a collection is less accepted in English. Um, so abstracting the three novellas from these collections and presenting them as a single volume um, seemed like the best way to go. Plus, they were very much in conversation with each other, given their setting and the way they all resonated in terms of theme. But to go back before that, um, how I first encountered Shuang Xue Tao was uh, through Zhang Yuran, another writer I translate. Um, in fact, she was the very first writer I ever translated. Um, and she contacted me to say she had um, come across this great writer, um, Shuang Xue Tao, and she sent me some of his short stories to look at, and then later some of his novellas. Um, and I fell in love with the writing for all the reasons you can imagine. It's vivid, it's fresh, it's from the Northeast of China, where we haven't had a lot of writers um, come from. Um, Yuran didn't um, mention that she was dating Shuang Xue Tao and they're now married. Um, and I've actually translated her most recent book. So they both have um, books out this year. Um, hers is Cocoon, which is being published by World Editions this October. Um, and that's my first husband and wife translation. But with Shuang Xue Tao, um, there was just something about his writing that 
I immediately knew I wanted to work with him. Um, it just leapt off the page. It was like nothing I'd ever read in any language. And I got into conversation with him and with his agent about the best way to present him in English. And putting these three novellas um, out for an English readership seemed like a way to go. Great, thanks. Um, that sounds all very, very exciting, uh, especially the translating husband and wife. <laughs> I've heard of husband and wife translators, but that's a new one. Uh, two, uh, second question is Rouge Street uh, by Shuang Shetao again. It's set in Rouge Street or Yanfen Street in the city of Shenyang, what's described as a post-industrial city where a once vibrant industrial economy is in decline. Koreans like me may uh, know this region as being once part of the Goguryeo dynasty centuries ago, and it's a popular destination for Korean history buffs to this day. There also seems to have been a coal mine in the city, although this may be a misreading on my part, because if, because if so, it seems extraordinary to me. And there is very little to go on in English Google. As you say, it's um, a very under-translated region of, of the world. So can you share with us any interesting historical details or events about this region and era that you came across when you were doing this translation? Well, unfortunately, um... I, I'm a translator who believes in a sense of place and, and rooting my translations um, where they take place. But um, alas, for obvious reasons, I have not been able to travel to Shenyang. Um, in the normal course of events, um, I would have tried my very best to get over there, to experience it for myself. Um, and what I was left with was Google Maps, reading around it, um, and the nine hour documentary by Wang Ping, uh, West of the Tracks, which documents um, exactly the region that Xue Tao is writing about. So I did have resources um, to draw from, but well, you asked for interesting facts and it's an area that's very hard to pin down. So I think that is a coal mine, but it's north of the city rather than in the city. Um, and there are other things I read which seem to be true or seem to be contradicted by other things I read, including the origin of the name Yenfen Street, whether it does mean Rouge Street and whether it means Rouge Street, because this was once the neighborhood where Rouge was reduced for the imperial court, or if it was named after a woman named Rouge who lived here. Um, there are contradictory accounts about where even the name comes from. And in the end, I realized that wasn't actually very important because Shang Shui Tao isn't writing about a real place. He's starting out in a real place, um, Yenfen Street, where he grew up, um, but it's also a liminal space. Uh, Yenfen Street itself um, no longer exists in the same form. The um, slum housing was cleared and you know it's now modern high-rise buildings. Um, so it's a space of the imagination, it's a space of memory, it's a space of nostalgia. Um, I spent an embarrassingly long time trying to locate Shadow Lake um, from Bright Hall before um, I just caved and asked him and he said, well, there's no such place as Shadow Lake. And then he later told me the story that I put in the foreword about, um, no, I think Madeline Tien put it in her foreword because after I told it to her. Um, about how he once saw a pond, but to him as a small child, it felt like a giant lake. And so he turned it into a giant lake in his retelling. Um, and so he's deformed the very geography of the place. Um, if you try to map out the stories, they don't quite line up. Um, and it's it does have a sense of place, I think, but that place is Shuetao's imagination or perhaps his memory. Um, rather than the actual Shenyang. That's really interesting. I was going to ask you about Shadow Lake because I did look up the city on Google. I found the street and I found the, is it Tieshi district? Like I found the district that the street is in. And then I tried looking for a lake nearby, but or a, or a coal mine. There were coal mining companies. And then I put on the, what is it? When you put on the satellite layer and trying to look for a lake. <laughs> I was like, oh, maybe it got filled in because China develops at such an extraordinary speed. Um, I'm very sorry to Madeline, but I did not read the forward because I wanted to get to the book quickly. And I normally don't read the forward. So uh, 
everyone maybe maybe you should read the four <laughs> because you will uh, miss important information like this yeah that's really interesting about how it is kind of like a, a place in his memory and um, apparently when we whenever we remember something we reconstitute the memory so sometimes details slip in and details slip out and we are basically recreating the fiction in our minds every time we remember something and so this has now manifested in the literal fiction that is Rue Street. Um, I wanted to ask a quick question about the title. So uh, you mentioned that this book was basically, uh, this book, the translation is basically a creation of um, the editor perhaps creating a book out of three novellas that were published separately. So what made you settle on the title Rue Street? I know it's kind of, obvious why you would but I'm also wondering um like any of the titles of the actual novellas would have done for like the title of this the collection like Love in the Big City for example but why did you settle on Rue Street for the title? Um there's something very slippery about the name um like as I said the origin of the name Yenfen Street or Rue Street is difficult to pin down in the first place um, but also, it felt like we wanted to root it in a location, um, even if that location was somewhat imaginary. Um, so that seemed like the common factor that the plays across all three novellas. We could have used one of the titles of the, any of the novellas, they all have great titles. Um, something intriguing like Moses on the Plane, although interestingly, uh, Moses on the Plane was recently turned into a film in China, um, but the authorities um, demanded a change in the title. So it's now called Fire on the Plane um, because we're not sure why, but discussion of Christianity seems to have become a sensitive topic. Um, so even, in Chinese, the titles are slippery creatures. I, I think Rouge Street sounds evocative. Um, and by not giving any one of the novels the position of title, we didn't put any of them um, at the forefront, but you come to them hopefully equally. I think there always is something, right? When you read a collection and you reach the title story, it's like, oh, this must be extra significant in some way. And I, I, we really didn't want that. Yeah, I get that, yeah. Um, Love in the Big City actually was not the title that I wanted for Love in the Big City. <laughs> I wanted the fourth chapter title, um, Late Rainy Season Vacation, because uh, that's just, yeah, that's the story that's set in Bangkok. And I prefer Bangkok to Seoul, sorry, if, if that scandalizes people. <laughs> but, but yeah, um, I got outvoted by, by the editors. Yeah, so that is super interesting. It kind of ties into, into the third question, I guess, the next question. So um, just to describe the novel, not the novel, the collection of novellas, why don't we call it a composite novel? Yeah, <laughs> just to describe the composite novel that is uh, Rouge Street. Uh, the first novella is the most straightforward on the surface. It's a very sensitively told tale of ordinary families on an ordinary street in a Chinese city. Uh, the second novella begins somewhat similarly, but turns into a crime novel with a completely unexpected yet, sorry for using this overused word, but there's no other word I could think of, astonishing ending. And there's the third novella that's an out and out crime thriller, which I believe has been dramatized more than once in Chinese media, uh, as uh, Jeremy described. Um, so in the process of this book coming together, uh, you have told us that the novellas were always were were published as separate books, and it was packaged like this for the English translation. Um, were there are there other stories that you considered, or maybe other works that you considered when putting this book together? Were, was this like always like the package that you envisioned for for this book? Um, we did look at some of the short stories, and you know, this was a conversation between me and um, Xue Tao and Xue Tao's agents, um, and then the editors when they got involved. Um, and I have translated some of his short stories, um, which are 
excellent and very much in the same voice in the same setting. But there's something about three novellas that felt resonant and I guess more in conversation with each other because they have the equal weight. I don't know if this is an artifact of the way we think in English actually. Um, because in, in Chinese, the word xiao shuo um, serves for all lengths of fiction. And, and we do divide into duan pian, zhong pian, and chang pian, so short, medium, and long form, but they're all xiao shuo. Um, whereas the insistence on separate words in English, um, I think, makes us think more of them as different genres rather than the same thing at different lengths. Um, but no, I, I think this was the form that felt right when we found it. And I'm, I'm really pleased with how these three novellas of equal weight um, are in conversation with each other. Yeah, it's, it always fascinates me how um, books like this come into translation because we're always being told as translators that, oh, short story collections don't sell. Um, we, we always have to package. Uh, and we have a lot of, for example, Korea has a lot of composite novels. So we have a lot of short stories that kind of are interconnected and become a novel. And, but in Korea, we don't call that a novel. We call that a short story collection. Although, like you said, xiao shuo, like it's the same word in Korean, it just means fiction, basically, in any length of fiction. Chang pyeon, chung pyeon, han pyeon, exactly the same Chinese words uh, we use in Korean. Yeah, so um, that it's, it's always interesting to me, like, how do we, it's not just how we sell the book to English readers, but how we sell the book to English publishers as well. So uh, thank you so much Metropolitan Books for uh, bringing this book out. So um, next question, let's talk about this Kang thing in the book. There's something called a Kang that keeps being mentioned in the book. I mentioned earlier that Koreans have, and they still do live in Northeast China. And I translated a whole book of stories myself set in this general region. It's titled um, The Underground Village uh, by Kang Byung-ye. And I was like, what the hell is a Kang? Is it Chinese ondo? That's kind of like what it sounds like. Uh, and then they talked about how they get on the Kang. But I'm like, if it's ondo, then wouldn't they be already on the Kang? So, so I Googled it and then I decided I wanted one installed in my apartment immediately. So it's like a heated platform uh, made for a living room or a bedroom that uses the heat of smoke from cooking fires to create a kind of warm sitting platform or sleeping platform for its inhabitants. Um, so what I did was I ended up not translating the word Kang in my book, I think. And I see that you've also transliterated it yourself in yours, which is very validating for me as a translator. Uh, so what do you think is the symbolism of Kang in Rouge Street? Because it keeps coming up in the stories. I mean, I, I don't think there is a particular significance to the Kang. I think it keeps coming up because every house has one. Um, and it's just something that um, is very present in this part of the world. So I, I felt made the most sense to me to not translate the word because there is no English equivalent. I think I did say the first couple of times she climbed onto the heated platform of the Kang or whatever. So there were context clues. Um, but beyond that, it's just a feature of every household because it is so cold in the northeast of China. And I think you really feel that, right? You feel the cold partly by the way all the characters are gravitating towards every heat source um, they can find. And when, when the fire goes out, when they wake up and it's freezing, you feel that they're on the calm, the calm is no longer warm. Um, so the idea of having this... Um, space that becomes the center of activity in the house because it's the only place that is heated. Um, I, I think conjures up a sort of a sense of people being thrown together, drawn together because they need to stay warm, um, not just to the car, but also to each other. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I hold by um, Deborah Smith's philosophy, which is that um, every translator gets to introduce a new word to the lexicon. So you can get one word that you don't translate, you just put that in and readers will have to learn that. Um, Kang wasn't my word because I have definitely seen the word Kang untranslated before. And because I've seen it in other books, I felt able to go, okay, great, I'm just going to use that too. Um, and then I'm going to introduce something else. So, um, yeah, I, I think there are all these concepts that don't really have a direct translation. 
And the more we are able to introduce these words so that readers are able to see the word calm and immediately have an association, and then that's the shortcut and you don't have to explain what it is and you can get into the world of the book that much quicker. Um, the more we do that, the easier we make it for the next translator. Yeah, that's really interesting um, what you just said about Deborah. Um, I definitely feel the same way. Yeah, because um, there were so many like intimate conversations that uh, went on around the Kang. And of course that's inevitable because it's kind of functions as like the hearth uh, of, the, of the house. And as you said, it's the one warm place in the house. So of course people are gonna gather there. Uh, I just thought it was, it was quite interesting because um, there's another book that um, you translated, which I'm going to discuss a little bit later called The Wedding Party by uh, Liu Xinwu. And I think it takes place like basically around the courtyard. Yes, there we go. <laughs> uh, basically around like a courtyard in, um, in a compound house where several families live. And it always interests me to see these like very kind of cultural space sounds very strange. Um, like a regional, like a, like a regional anchor kind of space, like a community bookstore is in Brooklyn, surely, because like people gather around community bookstore and, you know, the name is in the bookstore's name, community bookstore. Uh, so I've always, always been very interested um, in, in these kind of almost devices where characters can come together and have these intimate conversations, because kind of like the warmth of the Kang is like the warmth of their relationship with each other that is revealed in these conversations around the Kang. Uh, okay, so next question. Um, so there's quite a lot of crime in this book. I just talked a lot about intimate and warm conversations, but this is actually quite a violent book and there are a lot of exciting things happening, which I love. I love violence. I'm sorry. I just, I just love reading about violence. Uh, and this surprised me because I was expecting a kind of a very heartfelt intergenerational saga, you know, how we think of Asian literature and um, which it is, in a sense, but it's also quite gritty and violent and hair-raising, as I said. Uh, I'll be as vague as possible because I don't want to spoil anything, uh, but there are a few murders, some revenge, police seeking justice, taxi drivers being strangled, and identities being covered up. When we think of communist societies, we tend to think of them as fairly orderly, <laughs> sometimes orderly to a fault. Uh, why is there so much criminal subversion in this book, do you think? Um, what is the purpose of highlighting this particular type of conflict? I, I mean, I, I don't particularly think of communist societies as being orderly. Um, I think they might be rigid, which is not the same thing. Um, that just creates spaces in which the chaos can flourish. Um, so that's a Chinese saying, Shan Gao Huang Di Yuan, the mountains are high and the emperor is far away. And it's about being ungovernable and how when you are far away from the center of power, when you're on the periphery, you can get away with that much more. Um, so these characters are marginalized, they're desperate, they have very little going on in their lives. And that desperation is going to erupt in violence um, from time to time. It has to find an outlet. So the unruliness of um, Yenfen Street, um, I think, is why this becomes a space of violence. Um, it's because when you have no other way of getting what you want, then, you know, that can feel like the only way to shake up the order of the things, the only way to seize power for yourself, um, the only way to make the change that you need. Um, so yeah, it's gritty. It's, it's a space that is not really safe. That's kind of an edge of danger all the time. But it's also a space of generosity, of community, of people caring for each other in very difficult circumstances. Um, I think that all coexists within this book. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love that saying, the, um, the mountains are high and the emperor is far away. Um, when I lived in Hong Kong, we used to hear that all the time. Uh, I don't know if they're saying that anymore there. Um, and it is definitely, um, it is definitely a function of, of that kind of power where even though it gives you orderliness, 
the further you are away from it, like the less protection of it you have, but also the more freedom you have from it. And I definitely agree that um, the, the characters in the book do create a community and sen a sense of safety among all of that chaos and that marginalization. There's a lot of um, people kind of describe uh, going to being in Rouge Street as a kind of exile or, you know, they came down from the world and now they're in Rouge Street. Like there's a lot of that. So I kind of almost think that it's almost like a no-go zone or a wasteland almost, but you still see, you know, a lot of people just, you know, living lives just like everywhere else, people everywhere else. And that's part of um, the charm of, absolutely the charm of, uh, of the story. I also kind of saw all this uh, crime and this kind of like subversion and uh, the, the kind of return of suppressed or like oppressed violence or um, justice coming back as a kind, maybe a, a very, a very, very oblique commentary on the cultural revolution, which leads to uh, the next question. So the cultural revolution reverberates like throughout the book many characters are affected by it. At the same time, although it is not exactly directly discussed by the characters, and indeed one character shuts down a discussion of it like altogether, like her child asks her like, you know, what's the cultural evolution? And she just shuts that discussion down. And um, the cultural evolution, of course, refers to the 10 year period of the purging of capitalist and traditional thought and practices by Maoist forces. It is a time period that we hear a lot about, but then again, we kind of, don't hear a lot about it. And as a Korean, I think I recognize national trauma in literature when I see it. And it's only recently, for example, that the Korean war trauma is really beginning to be written about by authors like Kyung Suk Shin and Han Kang. Like before it would be very oblique. Now people are more directly confronting it. So how, do you, how is national trauma depicted in this book? Um, and what do you think the impact of the cultural revolution is in this narrative? And what do you think is perhaps the translator's role in bringing it out in a translation? This might be a very sensitive question. Really? Um, so th there is no shortage of writing about the Cultural Revolution in China. Um, in fact, there's an entire genre of writing about the Cultural Revolution called Shanghan Wenshui, scar literature. Um, it's been really excavated over and over. People have written about it to make sense of it. Um, but it's also generational. So Shuang Xuetao was born in 1983. Um, so almost a decade after the end of the Cultural Revolution, um, he didn't experience it himself. And yet it would have been all around him growing up. Right. Um, and I can't really imagine what that would be like. Like, all the adults in your life having lived through a traumatic event and the evidence of that being everywhere, but your generation being untouched by it, particularly because the country moved on so quickly. Um, by coincidence, um, the Zhang Yueran book that I translated, Cocoon, um, also deals with this subject. Um, Cocoon is about um, two young people um, in, um, today's China in um, a small city trying to solve a murder mystery. And the murder mystery is one of their grandfathers was murdered during the Cultural Revolution and who did it. Um, so it's the millennium, millen millennial generation trying to make sense of these events that they didn't live through. And in a similar way in Rouge Street, um, the young people, are dealing with the legacy of the Cultural Revolution. So it's present, but they didn't experience it themselves. It wasn't formative for them. And that's the generation that um, I've ended up translating a lot from. So I think my role has been to be informed about this period of history, to know what happened, but also to wear this knowledge lightly because it's there in the background, but it doesn't inform everyday life to the extent that it does for the people who live through it. Um, and it's that kind of looming presence where it's everywhere, but also nowhere at the same time um, that I've had to navigate. 
Yeah, um, I totally understand where, where Shuang is coming from in that sense, not only because he's only two years younger than I am, but also because I think my generation is the first generation, the first Korean, post-war Korean generation that was born and raised middle class that didn't go up to middle class, but was just experienced this. So we hear a lot about, we heard a lot about from our teachers and our parents about like how little there was to eat, but then we never experienced that. And so, as you say, like the trauma and the, the kind of the miasma of um, darkness is there, but we having never experienced it, it, it's kind of, when we write about it, it becomes kind of vague and it kind of like, it does inform the writing, but it doesn't, but we don't write directly about it. And I think that feeling is very much captured uh, in Chuang's book here. And that's really, really interesting. Okay, uh, so the next question. Um, I've noticed, as your fan, uh, that your most recent translations tend to focus on specific village or urban village level spaces. For example, again, The Wedding Party by Liu Xinwu takes place around a multifamily courtyard residence in Beijing, what is referred to as a Sihe Yuan. Sorry, I'm butchering the pronunciation. Uh, the Artisans, a vanishing Chinese village by Shen Fu Yu is about, well, a vanishing Chinese village. It's a very, very uh, interesting book. Uh, from Master House. And this book is of course set, uh, this book that we're discussing today uh, is set in the eponymous Ru Street or Yanfen Street in Shenyang, China. I know that uh, you are, are also, I also know you as a writer uh, and your books that you wrote, State of Emergency and It Never Rains on National Day have a very finely attuned sense, yes. Well, the award-winning State of Emergency um, have a very finely attuned sense of place and takes pain to bring out the nuance of each locality. Uh, for example, it never rains on National Day. Like there's a there's a story that takes place, I think, in Norway, uh, somewhere in Europe, where they're on a train, and I can like feel everything that is going on uh, outside the windows, like inside the train. Um, and yet, it's a very Singaporean story. Um, so, is this kind of uh, you you kind of touched upon it before, but is this kind of a theme that you're going for right now, this kind of um, village level, urban level, urban village level kind of story set around the space? And are we going to see a Jeremy Tang novel set in Queens, for example, <laughs> in the near future? Please do not title it Empress of Queens, or please do, I can't tell you what to do. Uh, can you tell us more about um, this aspect of, of your translation and your writing? Uh, yeah, um, I, that's a great question. I, I do think everything has a sense of place because, you know, we are corporeal beings. We, are, we exist physically in space and, and that space has materiality. And that's something that I try to be attentive to. Um, as someone who has a tendency to live inside my head, um, I often have to remind myself to be aware of my surroundings and to be present in the moment and all of those things. Um, and I try to bring the same quality of attention to my writing and translation. Because um, I, I think it is very easy. I, I do know what you mean. I think it's very easy to have the sort of book where everyone's just living in their heads and you could be really, you could really be in a room anywhere in the world, and you're having this somewhat disembodied conversation. Um, but I, I don't think that's true to the way we actually live. I think we are affected by our surroundings, and I think the milieu we find ourselves in, however we might wish to believe ourselves untouched by it, actually does affect us, and and does shape our lives, and so having an awareness of that, particularly with translation, um, particularly as I translate from so many places, um, that the book that I'm translating that's set in Shenyang is different to the one that's set in Beijing, is different to the one set in Taipei, is different to the one set in Singapore, not just because these are all distinct authors with their own voices and because the variety of Chinese that they use is slightly different, but also because these places are different. And that's an awareness that I try to keep front and center as I'm translating. Because um, you, you try to think yourself into the author's head, you try to attune yourself to the author's voice. Um, but I think you also have to become in sync um, with the space, the physical space um, where the story takes place. 
Um, this is this is going to sound extremely shallow, but um, my computer screensaver is always the setting of the book I'm currently writing or translating. Um, and it's, I don't know, I, I, I just like having a little daily reminder of location, uh, just as a way of thinking myself into it. And I do make use of Google Maps and pictures and whatever footage I can get my hands on to try and be in that space. So yeah, it's not something, it's not so much that I seek out things with a strong sense of place as that whatever I do choose to translate, um, this, its sense of place is one of the things that I um, am attuned to and that I try to foreground in my work. Um, I mean, Anton, I could turn this back on you because your recent translations have also, I think, been very grounded um, in physical space, particularly love in the big city, um, which I think you have said um, takes place in the same gay clubs where you yourselves have been a habitué and um, the book ends, um, I don't think it's a spoiler to say the book ends in Bangkok, where you have also spent time. So, um, could turn the question back on you. Is this something that you um, seek out or um, particularly foreground in your translation practice? I think with that particular book, it was very much like, oh, I recognize these places. And it got to a point where I was like, oh, I hope we don't have any ex-boyfriends in common. <laughs> um, is this someone I know? Yeah, it kind of got to that point where, and, and sense of place was was one of those things. Uh, I think Violets, for example, over here, um, by Kyung Sik Shin, it's, it's also set in a very specific part of Seoul where, um, the, where I actually used to work and I loved visiting all the time. It's a Gwangamun Plaza, like it's one of the central parts of Northern Seoul, if not the central part of Northern Seoul. And it was a huge attraction in me picking up this book and deciding, oh, this should be the next Kyung Suk Shin book to be translated because I know that Seoul is kind of having a moment. It's not my favorite city, but you know, <laughs> a lot of people seem to like Seoul. Um, and Seoul is having a moment and I was like, oh, I've been to these places, I can write about them. I've eaten at this restaurant. And so, but for me, that, that was kind of like, that was a bit, um, just like a very superficial reason for picking up the book. But for those three books that you translate that I mentioned, The Wedding Party, The Artisans, and um, here at Rouge Street, I really felt like, um, there's something uh, me, like, is there something going on like as a translator of picking out, picking out these books, um, whether you're kind of maybe trying to, maybe you're writing about uh, or translating about uh, where you live, New York City, maybe all of these translations are actually about New York City. Like I kind of had maybe that moment for a second uh, where you are reacting against the city that is actually around you, that you are corporeally present in and instead trying to go off and write about these other places so that you can kind of be in those other places. And this kind of leads to my next question. Um, so you're one of those translators whom people buy books based on the fact that you translated them. I think a really big reason why people do that and a big reason that I do that is because you really, in your translation over especially, you really present a, a panel be, I don't know how to pronounce the word, <laughs> a diversity of Chinese voices. It's not just like the kind of mainstream Beijing Han Chinese kind of uh, voice that we kind of expect from Chinese literature, but uh, from like, for example, um, Yenge is from uh, Sichuan and uh, like it's from Western China. And like, that's a very different voice that we don't really hear much from. And like, you know, you have you translate voices from, like you said, from Taipei, from you know Northeast China, which we don't hear a lot about, and um, and I was just that's really attractive to me because it really upends people's ideas about what Chinese literature should sound like or it or sounds like, and it's always very exciting to to see what you what you've decided to translate next. And um, we've had such a bonanza of Jeremy Tan books recently that so it kind of feels downright rude to ask this question. 
but what's coming up next for you? What can we expect from Jeremy Tian, both as a uh, translator and an author? Thanks, Anton. Um, I won't talk about my own writing just because I'm very, very slow um, and I don't want to create expectations. Um, with, with translations, um, I do believe in um, thinking about the translator's body of work um, and to be intentional about curating voices that I feel should be brought into English and thinking about what those voices are and, and how they are in conversation with each other. Um, and yes, how much they are underrepresented compared to what does get translated from Chinese, which is already a very small number of books to begin with. Um, right now I'm working on a collection of short stories by the Singaporean author Haifan. Um, the book is called Delicious Hunger, and the stories are drawn from his time as a communist guerrilla in the 1970s and 80s in the jungles of Malaysia. Um, and they are like nothing I've ever read. They are earthy, they, you know, are very much based on his hard scrabble existence in the jungle, hiding from government forces, um, killing and eating wildlife, including elephants, the trunk is the best bit, and just generally um, fighting a war that I think became increasingly clear was doomed to failure. Like by the late 80s, it was clear that Malaysia and Singapore were not going to become communist countries, but the Malayan Communist Party couldn't, having committed to this course of action, couldn't really do anything but keep fighting. Um, and that, it's that really interesting space that he's writing from um, now, um, three decades later, um, in recollection. So those, those stories, um, I'm working with um, closely with him. He's still writing very actively at the moment. I want to get through this book so I can get through his to his next one, Wild Pathways, um, which is a bestiary. Each story in that collection is based on one of the animals he encountered in the jungle. Um, and I'm also translating a play by the Taiwanese writer Wei Yijia um, called Big Zoo, um, which is set in a zoo that may or may not also contain the whole of society. So that's going to keep me busy for a while. To turn that back on you, Anton, what's up for you? That sounds so exciting. Like, I don't know why, but I'm always interested in books that are, that happen to do with like the breakdown of a communist party or, or some kind of, uh, so of progressive cause, like in, for example, I love the Golden Notebook by Doris Lessing. I love that whole sequence where, like, they're like, "Are we going to leave the party? Like, what the what's going on in the Soviet Union?" Like, I don't know why. Um, so I would actually love to uh, translate a book like that, but South Koreans are not quite allowed to write <laughs> um, books about um, communism. Uh, but uh, we'll we'll see what happens in the coming years because things are changing very rapidly. Um, next, what's coming up is, uh, well, I don't, it's, it's, you know, publishing is so weird because like sometimes you're allowed to say things that are coming up and sometimes you're not, but uh, I think I'm allowed to say that Ora Chung will be uh, translated again um, for uh, two of her books. Uh, one is a short story collection that's more hard science fiction than Chris Bunny, and one's going to be a novel, a science fiction novel, which I guess it's science fiction, but to me it reads more like like allegory almost because it's just so very very clear cut like oh you'll you'll know it when I when you read it if you read it um so that's coming up for me I still have to do the Duna science fiction for Knopf uh, it's called Counterweight it's very exciting it's about neo-colonialism and it's linked to colonizing uh the stars and I'm also doing a book of aphorisms by Lee Song Bok um which who is a very famous poet in Korea, but is very under-translated uh, overseas. So uh, I think that book is gonna be called uh, Indefinite Inflorescence. I always think it's, there is, I think it's, <laughs> it was a different name, but I always get the name wrong in, in English, but I will get it right by the time of publication. Uh, okay, thank you so much for, for answering these questions, our prepared questions, and now I think is time to take questions from the audience and to do that Noah is going to help us. 
Thank you both so much for this. Uh, you've given us all, I think, a lot to think about and a lot to look forward to um, from both of you. So that's very exciting. Um, folks at home, please remember you can submit your, your questions for Jeremy and for Anton using the Q&A button, which should be at the bottom of your screen. Um, looks like we have one already, so I'll go ahead and read that one. This is from Kevin Wong for Jeremy. Uh, Shuang tends to bunch dialogue all into the same paragraph and does not enclose them in, in quotation marks. I noticed your translation clarifies dialogue using paragraph breaks and dashes. How did you come to this choice and did you consider other options? Um, so this is something that um, is a feature of um, Shuang Shetao's writing, but is also a bit more common in um, Chinese fiction to um, have dialogue that isn't marked with quotation marks. Um, in Shuang's case, he bunches things up, as Kevin says, into um, a single paragraph. And it reads as quite repetitive, particularly in English, um, because the whole paragraph is, he said, yes, I said, why? He said, because I wanted to. I, you know, it kind of goes on in that vein, which I think is more effective in, um, in Chinese than it is in English, where it becomes um, a little too rhythmic, a little too repetitive. Uh, and this was a conversation I had with um, our editor, Brian Lax, who I see is on this call. Hi, Brian. Um, about the best way to present this and should we keep this? Is there another way we could do it? Um, should we just break it down and present it conventionally with quotation marks? Should we, um, you know, have it on its own line in some other way? And um, at a certain point, we came up with the idea of using dashes to isolate um, dialogue that had multiple um, lines. If it was just one or two lines, we kept it in the body of the paragraph and kept the, he says this, and I say this. Um, but more than that, um, it seemed to be easier to read um, if we broke it into this format. But yeah, that was, that was one of the many, many choices you make when bringing a work um, from a very different literary culture. Um, I, I should mention that um, Kevin Wang is also one of Shuang Shetao's translators. Um, and I'm going to paste his story, which appeared in Asymptote um, here in the chat. So everyone, please read Kevin's translation. Um, yeah. That was fantastic. Thank you for, for sharing those nuts and bolts. I always love to hear how people deal with these very technical um, grammatical issues in translating. Um, and thank you for sharing Kevin's uh, translation as well. We have another question from an anonymous attendee, um, and you might have to look at it, Jeremy, because there is, some, uh, I assume it's Chinese in here that I cannot read. Um, so how did you come to translate this word as aeronaut rather than the, the closer dictionary choice, aviator? Um, so when I hear the word aviator, I immediately think of airplanes, and I think most people do as well. Um, but the title character in Fei Xingjia, the aviator, isn't an aviator. Um, he's interested in less conventional means of flying. Um, when, when we first meet him, he's having this um, vision of a world in which we have what we now call rocket packs. But he's kind of thinking of what everyone has their own personal flying device and we can just like rise above the streets and, and move around. Um, and I don't want to give away the ending of the story too much. Um, so all I will say is that there is a flying device that is not an airplane um, at the climax of the story. And so I didn't want to use the word aviator. I felt like that would lead the reader in a certain direction that would not be helpful. But also there was something very old fashioned about the the way invention happened in this novella. Um, there was kind of an old school, I'm going to be a scientist in my lab, I'm going to put this thing together for the betterment of mankind. And for me, the, world, the word aeronaut um, also felt old fashioned in that same way, that it had the right resonance um, for who this character was. He wasn't an aviator, which, you know, reeks of a certain kind of modernity, it's the Wright brothers, it's Amelia Earhart. 
this is a completely different type of person who was into flying. And so the word aeronaut felt um, more accurate. I love that. I think you're completely right. I mean, it's a little more uh, Jules Verne than Howard Hughes. Um, that's fantastic. <laughs> um, so it looks like we're still waiting for more questions to come in. Um, so folks, please do submit your questions. But in the meantime, I have one um, for, for both of you. Um, I've heard you both say that the, your recently translated, uh, your recent publications have a lot to do with each other or maybe overlap in interesting ways. Um, and since we have you both here, which is so fantastic, I was hoping you could maybe talk about the ways that your, your recent publications maybe talk to each other, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, I, I mean, reading um, Violence, um, which is now out from Feminist Press, um, what really struck me um, and resonated, I think, with Rue Street was the experience of alienation. So earlier we were talking about the sense of place um, that these books have. But also interestingly, um, some of these characters aren't really um, connected to these places because they're so shut up in themselves. Um, so San, the main character of Violence, um, is in a flower shop in Seoul, but also she doesn't really fit in anywhere. Um, so it almost doesn't matter where she is. She feels out of place. She's living in her own mental landscape, um, trying to make sense of existence, but she can't because she's disconnected from the world. Um, similarly, the characters in Rouge Street, many of them um, can't find their place in the world, which is an artifact of them just not being able to fit into society or with the people around them. But also, I think, um, a symptom of the way that um, China has not made a space for many particularly young people, um, where the juggernaut of progress has moved so fast that many have been left behind, including entire communities, as in large areas of Shenyang, um, the milieu of the novel, the novellas. So yeah, the, the experience of, re of alienation, which I think is something that many of us anywhere feel because, because we live in 2022, and I don't need to tell you the many reasons why um, we might be disconnected from our surroundings. Um, feels like something that is very timely. I don't know, Anton, did you feel that? Yeah, it was a, it was a huge factor in why I chose um, my more recent books. And uh, actually Jeremy, Jeremy's work had uh, some influence on that. For the first three books that I did, like as much as I enjoyed doing them, they're kind of very big, very historical, very kind of a bit older work that is perhaps um, that I kind of did under a sense of obligation of, of like what I thought people wanted to read about Korea. <coughs> Excuse me. But then um, I would read works by like by Jeremy or um, by other uh, translators like Arunava Sinha, who are much more deliberate in how they pick their work. Um, I forget who, who wrote it, but uh, there's this book called The Secret Talker that Jeremy uh, translated. And I remember just, just like reading it. I, I only bought that book because Jeremy translated it. So I had no expectations about like what the book was going to be about or how it was going to. It was so, I really enjoyed reading it because it was like, wow, this story is really very, very innovative just the way that, that it's built. And I really enjoyed that. And I feel like, um, I, remember, uh, I remember thinking like, I really would like to do something that is more contemporary, that is perhaps uh, doesn't require so much historical research would be nice. And uh, when Jeremy and I were both at uh, the same residency at one point, he was working on Yenga's um, uh, Strange Beasts of China. And I was working on Cursed Bunny. And I remember like thinking, oh, wow, we're both doing books about weird animals. <laughs> and um, the way Jeremy described the book to me, I, I can't read Chinese, so I, I couldn't read it. But the way Jeremy described the book to me, it was like, I was like, oh, you know, it's about, uh, it's about, you know, these weird people who are also beasts and they live in China. And I'm like, 
okay, I'm not sure how interesting that is. And then I actually read the book and it was, it was like an incredible book. It was like, it's very melancholy and very urban and very, very unlike any other book that um, really that, that I've, that I'd read at that point. And it's kind of weird to think how we were working on, I was working on Chris Funny while he was working on um, a Strange Piece of China together at the same time. And maybe they were kind of like feeding off of each other's energy. I think there definitely is a kind of subconscious zeitgeist or movement that uh, everyone kind of like taps into. And I think that was like the mood of the moment. And now it's with books like Violet, Love in the Big City, um, Rouge Street, and um, you know, The Wedding Party. I think now the zeitgeist is like, how do we define like the place that we, that we live in? How do we see it so that we see it as inhabitable and we see it as a community and we see it as something in which we live in instead of just mindlessly living through it just because we happen to be put there by fate. Or circumstance and yeah I think that is like the current kind of mood the literary mood of the world right now I may be over general of course I'm over generalizing but yeah that that's how I kind of like feel the zeitgeist right now yeah I feel you and you know I think in a moment of alienation the best remedy is a good book so thank you both of you for, for bringing us those good books um, to help us out of our alienation in this uh, alienating time. Uh, I think we are just about out of time for this evening, but oh, we maybe have one more question. Uh, yes, let's get to this one before we, before we sign off. Uh, this is from Anne-Marie Lax. I was so pleasantly surprised at the comedy in the stories. Comedy tends to be a very hard thing to translate from different cultures. Did you find that a particularly hard piece to translate? Um, in this case, it was mostly comedy of situation, um, which I find easier to translate because I think the things we find funny about circumstances um, resonate more across cultures. Um, puns and jokes and all that kind of humor is intensely difficult and I often end up making up entirely new jokes. Um, but no, I, I, I think there are things about Shuang Shui Tao's writing that are just elementally funny and would be funny to any reader. So all I really had to do was recreate those situations and the inherent absurdity and humor came across. That's, that's wonderful. And that's a, a great note to end on, I think. Um, much lighter note than that <laughs> of alienation. Um, again, thank you both so much for doing this with us. This has been really a pleasure to listen to and be a part of. Those of you at home, thank you for your very thoughtful questions. We hope you'll consider purchasing a copy of Rue Street from Community Bookstore and to see you at another virtual event very soon. Um, thanks again. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. Good night.